It's saying on. It sounds like it's on to me. It's a terrifying thing to hear your own voice booming from the heavens. Well, if you guys uh, yes, met with the editors last week of um, Understanding Creation, you probably noticed that they're very mean people. Oh, yeah, yeah, editors, they're all very mean. And um, they did an, 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 a number of things. One, uh, they decided that this book should be written at the level of normal human beings. And nobody's normal and nobody's average. And there's so much to talk about. And in addition to that, uh, they restricted us, uh, those of us who are writing these chapters, to 2,400 words. And then they gave me this title. You know, what is the evidence for a creator? Wow, in only 2,400 words? You've got to be kidding me. But I will uh, go through this chapter, and then maybe we can discuss, discuss it a little bit. Um, I'm sure that there is plenty there that I can be critiqued for. And that's pretty easy because, um, you know, obviously in 2,400 words, or sorry, uh, 2,000, yeah, 2,400 words, you just can't chase every rabbit down every hole, and you can't uh, use every wonderful and fantastic evidence possible out there for the creator. All you can do is give a little bit of a general idea maybe one or two little examples, and um, you have to keep those at the level of people who are not scientists, but uh, people who are interested in being informed in a general sense about what kinds of answers might be available out there to these questions that everybody is asking, but particularly uh, people who are in college, uh, maybe people who are in non-Adventist colleges who are uh, uh, wanting to be Christians, wanting to uh, maintain their belief in God's word, while at the same time being challenged uh, continually with alternative ideas, particularly about where they came from. So, uh, as you're well aware, there are two views about evidence for a creator. On the one hand, you have the idea that there's no evidence. And this is not a new idea. You know, one of the number one myths that I encounter out there is now we know so much more and we realize that there is no evidence um, out there in nature for a creator. That's nonsense. People have thought that they realized that for an awfully long time. Uh, this is Cicero uh, writing uh, in his book, De, uh, De Natura Deorum, uh, that's uh, just Latin for um, basically on the nature of the gods. And he has this dialogue going um, between proponents of different views of what the gods are. There are the Stoics there and uh, various other groups. There aren't any Christians because this was written before there were any Christians. This is before the time of Christ. Um, but different ideas, different philosophical ideas out there about God and the gods. And here he has Valenius, and uh, he is the Epicurean in this dialogue. And he says, for he, this is Epicurus, who taught us all the rest, has also taught us that the world was made by nature without needing an artificer to construct it. So whatever you bring... It can't be evidence for a creator because Epicurus told us that that's not how things came to be. If it looks like evidence for a creator, it must be a misinterpretation or something like that. And certainly, you know, we encounter this exact same view today. Um, I know that my daughter, being taught at a certain Seventh-day Adventist secondary institution uh, locally, was taught by one of her teachers that there is no evidence for a worldwide flood. Hmm. I'm glad I spent my money to send my daughter to a Seventh-day Adventist school. Or maybe I'm not. Um, I'm sorry. You know what? There is plenty of evidence for a worldwide flood, whether you believe that it occurred or not. There's plenty of evidence out there that is interpreted well within that kind of framework. And the same is true when it comes to the idea of a creator. 
Um, the evidence is abundant, and certainly you see this view expounded on from the beginning of the scriptures to the end. Here is Paul talking in Romans. He says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So we've got these two uh, views out there. Both of them are ancient views. Um, there is nothing new about the debate about origins that we experience today. Um, I was trying to write to an audience that is interested, but they're not all scientists, they're not all philosophers. Uh, some of them might be art majors um, or uh, you know, uh, studying Spanish or something like that. They might even be Canadians, so I had to keep it simple <laughs> uh, in any case. Uh, so what I tried to do was pick one one overarching thing that pretty much anybody can understand. One characteristic of nature that is out there and in abundance. And that characteristic that I chose was interdependence. Nature exhibits interdependence on a spectacular level. What is Inter interdependence. Well, I defined it this way, and I'm not sure that this is a really good or complete definition, but hey, I wasn't trying to write a, an entire chapter trying to define what interdependence is. I think most people kind of have a general idea of what that might mean, um, as long as they understand the English language, but I defined it as individual forms elegantly, uh, that elegantly fit functions of a greater whole. Things fit into systems in a very elegant way. Maybe I should have added to it, or maybe I should have said individual forms elegantly fit functions of a greater whole on which they depend for existence. Because certainly that is the case with living things. But I was trying to keep things fairly broad and simple. Interdependence is found in everything uh, from design of the universe to the ways in which organisms interact with other organisms and their physical environment. Everywhere you look, interdependence is present. It's not something that you can say, well, I can explain away this individual case over here or that individual case over there, so therefore it doesn't exist. It is overwhelming and uh, universal. So one example that I chose to use was carbon. Um, carbon, it is the ideal building block to form the molecules that are fundamental to life. Um, people have uh, tried thinking about other um, forms of life that might be built off other atoms. As it turns out, um, none of them look particularly promising. Uh, I went back to H.G. Wells and uh, he thought about um, uh, silica-based uh, life and, and so on. Yeah, you know, these are all interesting thought experiments and so on. However, there's something really special about carbon. It's just right. It's just a wonderful, wonderful atom. And it's pretty hard to conceive of anything like life as we know it without carbon. So uh, carbon illustrates interdependence because of the role it plays in living things and because its existence requires physical laws to interact in specific ways for its creation and maintenance. Everybody, I think, who has really studied this out recognizes what a special atom. It really is. And there are all of these various things that have to come together to get it as special as it is. You can't go messing around with the fundamental uh, forces and constants and so on in the universe and uh, expect to wind up with something as wonderful as carbon when you do that. All of these forces act in interdependent kinds of ways and um, everything seems to be linked together. So if you start messing with it, you've got some problems on your hands. Um, you could say the same thing 
for the entire universe. Um, you know, it's, it's um, uh, all of these laws, they, they work in exactly the right way. Uh, the Milky Way, the solar system, and the Earth itself. All of these physical things in our environment are just right. They're just perfect. I want to illustrate that by, by talking about gravity because it's easy to understand. Uh, you know, those physicists, they like to talk about other things. I think it's because most of them will admit that they don't really understand gravity. So it's better to talk about something that's more confusing to you, like the electroweak force or something. But gravity is pretty easy to understand. Um, it's one of several physical constants that must be just right for our life-friendly universe to exist. Um, if you look at our sun, gravity is just right for our sun to exist uh, and, and, uh, and to, to, to run in a way that has a sustained fusion reaction going in it. It's basically a great big hydrogen bomb in the sky, and it's um, uh, burning at just the right uh, rate, at just the right distance from the Earth uh, to provide us with just the right kinds of wavelengths of energy that um, allow us to harvest that energy and use it to drive life. Really, without it, um, it's pretty hard to conceive of life uh, without the sun. Some people have talked about uh, chemosynthesis and so on. Um, mm, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. But that seems pretty heroic to resort to something like that. What if, what if um, gravity was a little bit stronger than it is right now? What would that do to, to our sun? And by the way, any number of other things. Well, um, that would increase the rate of fusion in the sun, so the sun would get a lot hotter. And the question is, what would happen then? Would the sun become so hot that the whole thing just explodes? Or um, would it just burn really bright and with uh, wavelengths that are uh, very destructive uh, and so on? Or what exactly would happen? It's hard to imagine that it would be a good thing. And then you have so many other things, you know, trying to maintain galaxies, trying to maintain solar systems, trying to get everything balanced out in the way that it is so that our Earth can maintain life. It's hard to imagine if gravity is just a little bit stronger than it is right now. And then you run into additional uh, problems if you believe in Big Bang cosmology, for example, trying to get this... Um, uh, steadily expanding universe that we seem to be in is a tricky business if you start messing around with gravity. And then if gravity was a little bit weaker, um, then we'd have reduced or no fusion. In fact, uh, the sun or stars might not hold together at all. We might have no suns and no stars. We might just have a universe with um, uh, you know, matter, if it exists at all, spread about in various ways. Gravity is just right, and there are a bunch of other things that are just right, and they all act in an interconnected way. That's why we have you know, these lovely equations in physics that describe those interactions. They all interact in various ways that happen to be just right for life to exist. So that raises the question. How many coincidences do we need uh, before we start suspecting something other than coincidence? Um, our universe exhibits multiple factors that can coincide uh, with the necessities of life. How many coincidences must occur before something is attributed to design rather than good fortune? The example that I use in the chapter is... Um, you know, somebody just keeps winning the lottery over and over again, and then you find out, I think it's the uh, person who runs the lottery's wife. Um, wow, you know, uh, are you really going to attribute, you're just going to say, well, that's a lucky woman being married to a man with a good job like that, and she keeps winning the lottery. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, no, you know, th those kinds of coincidences we just don't believe in. And... Um, and we've certainly uh, won the lottery with this particular, or won the jackpot, let's put it that way, with this particular Earth and this particular universe that we live in. Um, yeah, some sort of cosmic jackpot 
seems unlikely given that there's no cosmic slot machine out there. Okay? And there's no one playing it, according to those who don't believe in, 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 in a designer or whatever. Um, uh, you know, when people start attributing things to chance, when chance itself doesn't exist, that's pretty extreme. And I don't really know of a way of discussing chance in a, um, in a coherent way absent a universe, and absent energy, absent space, absent time, absent matter. Uh, well, you know, our conception of chance operates within those um, parameters. In any case, uh, the, yeah, but when we talk about these abiotic um, necessities on which life depends, uh, we're talking about a different kind of interdependence than uh, what we're talking about when it comes to life life itself. Life depends on carbon and the universe, but carbon and the universe don't appear to depend on life. I think most people would agree that you don't need life for the universe to exist, except for some people who have some wacky ideas about quantum mechanics. But anyway, yeah. on the other hand, you know, life depends on other life. Life is genuinely interdependent. Um, and there are many, many um, uh, examples, obviously, that we could give of that. But I want to just jump sideways a little bit and ask a question, and that is, is there a life lottery out there? Or is there a life slot machine or whatever um, on this earth? Um, one of the things that's very common when people start talking about evidence for a creative is people start talking about chance. I'm not a great fan of those arguments, you know, when you start talking about um, uh, hemoglobin. I remember one of my, one of my wonderful uh, professors uh, back when I was an undergraduate at Andrews University. I mean, this guy was really a saint. And I know what he was doing, and I agree that his argument was very good at illustrating an issue. However, the issue is not real. And that is, uh, he, he took hemoglobin and used that, the, one of the globin molecules as an example of um, unbelievable improbability. And of course, um, because hemoglobin, for its existence, is dependent on many, many other molecules, it's a good example of this interdependence, actually. You're not going to get hemoglobin or the um, uh, globin proteins without things like uh, the whole transcription machinery, the whole translation machinery, and a bunch of other stuff. You've got to have energy, so therefore you've got to have all of that machinery that's involved in energy metabolism, and it goes on and on. The point is, with this thing is, I don't believe there's a life lottery out there as well. Okay? There's no... Uh, the, the, when people talk about probabilities like that, the assumption is that there is, you know, yeah, a great big slot machine out there and somebody's feeding it quarters and pulling the, the, the arm on it. But that's just not the case. When you look at what life is made out of, life is made out of um, proteins, for you. proteins, um, the, the, these, these, big, these big molecules, proteins, the nucleic acids like DNA and RNA, um, polysaccharides like starch and, uh, and that sort of thing, uh, cellulose, all the, you're, sitting, you're sitting on a polymer right now and you're made out of polymers. And these polymers, they're all made in the same way. So I'm going to show you an example, a very, very short example. You'll be pleased to know um, uh, of, of how these things are made if you're looking at an amino acid. Um, amino acids, I'm guessing most of you know what amino acids are, but you've got an amine group and you've got an acid group this symbolic one that I've got up here is, uh, is leucine. It's symbolized with an L. And um, if I brought in an isoleucine and attached it there, forming a peptide bond, I would remove a water molecule. Now we call this a condensation reaction. Condensation reactions um, are very important. If I was to bring in a phenylalanine, I'd remove another water molecule to join this together. Uh, another condensation reaction. And then if I brought in a, a glutamate, I'd have another condensation reaction removing a water molecule. Um, does this look like the kind of reaction that would occur in water? Spontaneous. 
spontaneously. <laughs> well, um, you know, this is not the way chemistry works. It's just the opposite of the way chemistry works. To get reactions like this, you have to have a machine that uses energy to join these molecules together in an aqueous environment. There's no, uh, there, there, there's no other way that I can think of of doing it um, unless you do a whole bunch of very complicated chemistry that is, is, is sort of a whole different thing and certainly not what living things do. It's, it's what, um, uh, yes, I, I, um, uh, I've made, uh, for example, um, uh, short uh, nucleic acid uh, stru stretches uh, uh, um, uh, using chemistry alone, but um, that's not a trivial thing to do. That's not a trivial thing to do. And you've got to get the energy from somewhere. Okay? In the case of amino acids, they're not carrying that energy along in any kind of realistic way. Um, and, and you know, all of life is made from these things that have, um, that involve condensation reactions. Even things like triglycerides and so on, condensation reactions. Over and over and over again, they're everywhere in there. There is no lottery machine um, out there in nature joining these things together in warm little ponds to see if they can make a living thing. In any case, um, this does also help to illustrate why you have to have molecular machines. And when you look at these molecular machines, their parts are interdependent. I like this particular one. This is ATP synthase. So uh, those of you who ate breakfast, you're awake and you have energy right now because of, because of these guys working away in, in your uh, mitochondria, providing you with that uh, energy that you need from the sugar on your um, uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes or whatever it was you, you had. In any case, um, if you look at this machine, it's, it's really, uh, th I'm, I'm giving you the simplified one. Yeah, you, when you eat your breakfast, you also feed the E. coli in your gut. And um, if you went to the bathroom this morning, you flushed billions, possibly trillions of these masterpieces down the toilet, which seems like a tragedy uh, to me because they're so wonderful. But if you, if you look at these things, you can basically think of them as being like a, a, um, a, 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 a turbine coupled uh, generator, something like these um, uh, uh, windmills that, that you see when you, when you drive out towards Palm Springs on, on the 10. Um, uh, up there at the top, you have a, uh, uh, a, a, a component that's made up of multiple proteins that applies torque as protons flow through it. And that torque is transmitted through that greenish uh, drive shaft protein down to uh, this generator portion there at the bottom. And um, uh, you know what? All of those parts are interdependent in various ways. Um, you're probably familiar, I'm assuming, if you've been coming to this Sabbath School class for a while with the idea of, of irreducible complexity. Um, certainly, molecular machines like this illustrate that property quite well. If you remove that drive chart protein, you have a wonderful turbine and you have a wonderful generator, but you're not going to get anything done uh, with them. Uh, so uh, these bits and pieces are interdependent. Yes, is it possible to come up with some exotic and complex story in which one day there was a windmill doing nothing and one day there was a generator doing nothing and somehow or other nature brought them together? Yes, if you want to, if, if, if you're desperate enough. You might go for um, uh, fanciful stories like that. However, that isn't the way that I um, think when I look at the windmill farm uh, driving towards Palm Springs. And I bet it isn't the way that you think about the windmill farm either. There really is no um, uh, compelling reason that I see to attribute something like this to anything other than some kind of nice engineering going on. So. Um, if we go beyond 
molecular machines. There are a bunch of other things that we can look at. Um, the, these molecular machines are themselves interdependent, for, but they form interdependent um, subcellular systems, and a significant number and a significant number of them are required for life. Um, everything sort of all interconnected in various ways. And then, obviously, you can go um, uh, beyond, beyond just the cells themselves. In complex organisms, obviously, if it's a single-celled organism, uh, only the cell, cellular level is really um, where you can go to. But um, certainly, between different cell types, you have complex interdependence uh, going on there in tissues and between tissues and uh, that comprise organs. They, they're interdependent and they have to work together and they, they fit their function quite well. Uh, between organs and, um, uh, and organ uh, systems, <laughs> uh, you have these things. And ultimately, the organisms themselves um, can be seen as nice examples of interdependence. Your brain doesn't do very well without your heart. Um, your lungs don't do very well uh, without your brain, as it turns out and so on. All of these bits and pieces are interdependent on one another. These are integrated systems. Obviously, there are alternative explanations. Outside of biology, however, uh, interdependent systems would normally be recognized as design because design posits an adequate cause for the phenomena observed. Um, this is one of the probably, um, you know, central things that philosophers do. They're looking for adequate causes for phenomena, uh, for what's observed. And, um, and certainly, uh, design is an adequate explanation, some sort of engineer, some sort of creator for the windmills out towards Palm Springs. And it's certainly uh, an adequate explanation for these molecular machines, these, um, uh, uh, you know, all of these systems all the way up that you see in, in living organisms. The best alternative, at least that I've been able to find, is the Darwinian mechanism of unguided variation coupled with natural selection. That's why it's so good. But everybody, including Darwin himself, recognized that um, natural selection needed a little bit of help. And one of the classic examples that's out there is uh, this, the peacock's tail. This particular peacock, his name was Ponsonby. Um, here he is, he's on my father's back porch. For some reason or other, Ponsonby showed up one day and decided that that was where he lived. And uh, yeah, he was a very interesting uh, guy. He'd come and eat out of your hand and was very beautiful and uh, had a beautiful tail. And the standard uh, explanation, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine how this tail would not be a handicap uh, for Ponsonby. You can see that it's uh, about as long as his body, maybe a little bit longer. It's a lot lighter because it's just made out of feathers, but it's still a big thing. It takes a lot of energy to make it and, and so on. It's hard to imagine how something like this would make an organism more fit. So this is why the explanation of sexual selection was generated to account for things like this. As it turns out, uh, it took um, you know, well over 100 years to actually do the experiment, but it turns out that um, male peacocks without a tail make just as many baby peacocks as male peacocks with a big spectacular tail. Um, so uh, sexual selection is not really a great explanation for things like this. And uh, my point is, everybody, everybody understands that it's a bit of a struggle to explain at least some things in this, within this Darwinian framework. And um, sometimes these exotic explanations, um, when you test them, don't work out that well. Here's really the big question that I think anyone can, can struggle with. Could all the interdependence in nature really be produced in small incremental changes filtered through natural selection? Could they really be made that way? Is that, you know, I'm not talking about one thing here or one thing there. The whole of nature is constructed 
around various interdependent things. The physical constants, the molecular machines inside cells, the cells themselves, the organisms. And you, know, you can go all the way up to, to the ecology and, and, uh, and, and, and on and on and on. Could all of them be accounted for by small incremental unguided changes and natural selection? Um, because that's, that's really the question that needs to be, to be answered. Um, on the face of it, interdependent systems are the kind of thing that intelligent agents make. Creators make interdependent things. And um, when you, th 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 there's another issue that interdependence brings up. And that is, once you've got interdependence, altering it is a tricky business. Um, the, the example that I like to use um, is airliners. Um, airliners are made, or air aircraft, comprise multiple interdependent systems. And when you look at crashes, generally speaking, aircraft crash when those interdependent systems start failing and the pilot fails to or cannot compensate for those failures. Now, that's not always the case. Obviously, sometimes people fly airplanes into the ground or into the White House or into uh, places and stuff like that. Yes, pilot error is a very um, uh, uh, tempting explanation. However, multiple times, if you go and you actually look at the um, the, the reports that are written up by people who are experts in these things, uh, you find out that there uh, sometimes, uh, for example, um, uh, the example that I use in this chapter, a BMI flight uh, crashed because of a slight, a little tiny engine upgrade. And the plane crashed because the systems are interdependent. And you change one little thing over here and... Um, there are a whole bunch of uh, consequences and the plane flies into the ground. Or well, it doesn't fly into the ground, it just winds up on the ground. People get hurt. Um, this same principle also applies to nature itself and particularly life. And this is not what I wanted to talk about, but this is one reason why we should be deeply, deeply concerned about conservation and uh, and the loss of species and what, what we're doing to the planet, our planet right now. Um, should be deeply concerned about that because it really is an interdependent system. So if we go beyond individual organisms, humans and other organisms are really ecologies of multiple organisms. Yeah, a lot of people don't like to think about this, but um, it turns out that when God made us on day six, he didn't just make us, which is probably a good thing, he made a whole bunch of other organisms that happen to live along with us and keep us happy, like those E. coli in your gut. There's that whole flora that lives in your gut, and, and trust me, you would miss them if they were gone in a big way. There are actually more non-human cells in your body than there are human cells, in part because human cells are big relative to little tiny bacteria. But you are covered with and filled with bacteria that do all kinds of things. The great experiment that I just read about, now I, it was just a little news article, and I just read about it yesterday at breakfast. Um, Canadian researchers, as I recall it. <laughs> and um, uh, they were looking at mice because Canadians care so much about mice. And um, what they found was they could actually change the mood of mice by altering the bacteria in their gut. Yeah, that's kind of an amazing thing. Um, wow, I'd have never thought that, but uh, I guess that's why doctors come up with things like fecal transplants. Man, I'm glad I'm not a doctor. Anyway, um, 
ecological cycles on which all life depends may also be, co be composed of various interdependent organisms. Um, everybody's familiar with the carbon cycle, and obviously in the carbon cycle we have zillions of organisms that do photosynthesis um, or chemosynthesis, and we have zillions of organisms that do respiration, and all of this stuff has to work together or there will be no carbon cycle. And remember that life you can think of as life, uh, of life as basically a chemical reaction that isn't going to equilibrium. It isn't going to equilibrium because there is this constant flux of energy that is going through living things and driving chemical reactions in particular directions instead of allowing them to go to equilibrium. So uh, this is a this is a big a big deal. Uh, obviously, uh, the carbon cycle when it comes to energy and building ourselves and all sorts of things, but. Um, the nitrogen cycle is far more complex and my personal favorite. Let's look at a very quick, um, uh, uh, simplified version of the nitrogen cycle. We've got all of this nitrogen in the air. Um, what is it, about 80% of the atmosphere? And um, nitrogen uh, in this particular form has a triple bond between the nitrogen atoms. And that uh, triple bond is very, very strong. Uh, so breaking it takes a lot of energy, putting it back together releases a huge amount of energy. That's why explosives are made out of nitrogen, like trinitrotoluene um, or nitroglycerin. You're taking nitrogen, you're holding it there um, uh, in, in a different uh, form, and then you do something so that the nitrogens can start reforming that triple bond. Bang. It's great. A um, lot of energy. That energy ultimately does come from the carbon cycle, though so these two things are intimately linked in that way and in other ways as well. That nitrogen is fixed. We could spend the whole rest of the day, Dantelow and I got on the phone the other day and got going on, on nitrogen fixation. I mean, that alone is just an astonishing, astonishing um, feat that nature does. But in any case, a nitrogen fixation, ultimately you get ammonia, that's used to make amino acids in plants, and that's what we make, use to make our proteins. Um, nitrification uh, takes ammonia and uh, converts it into nitrate so that you can have a reserve of nitrogen in the soil that plants can take up. And denitrification returns that nitrogen to the atmosphere. Imagine what would happen if you didn't have denitrification going on. All of the nitrogen would ultimately get stored up in the, on the surface of the Earth. And um, in fact, some people think that that's why there is very little or almost no nitrogen, for example, on the surface of Mars. It's a pretty good indicator that there is no nitrogen cycle going on if there's no nitrogen in the atmosphere of a planet that really should have it. Um, you have also uh, things going in the other direction in this particular cycle. There's assimilation, and that assimilation is driven by the reducing capacity uh, that is produced by something uh, called photorespiration, which was once thought another link there between the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle. Oh, I, it's so much fun. Anyway, um, atmospheric nitrogen fixation also occurs due to thermal shock, things like lightning and so on. This is why we can find in the one place that we know of where the carbon cycle is broken on the face of the Earth, the Atacama Desert, it's the, the driest place on Earth. And the nitrogen cycle is, is broken. Nitrogen builds up on the surface of the Earth there. And you can actually see, uh, that's, that's why it's the only place where it's commercially viable to mine uh, nitrate. Fertilize. Yeah, fertilize it, exactly. And explosives. Yeah. That's why in the First World War, the British, the, 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 the British Navy boycotted, oh, oh sorry, um, uh, bar barric, uh, oh, what's it called? Blockaded. Blockaded, blockaded yes. The, um, the coast of South America so that they couldn't export uh, nitrate and the Germans couldn't get it and make explosives. And so the Germans, being the geniuses that they are, came up with the harbor process and that's how we get our nitrogen today. In any case, can you see how interdependent this whole cycle is? If you start breaking components of this cycle, you have an immediate huge problem that gets worse and worse and worse as time goes by. And it doesn't take very long until you have a massive, massive problem on your hand. And hands. And I want to point out something. All of these steps here pretty much are mediated by different organisms 
uh, they're microorganisms of, of various kinds, bacteria and so on. And um, wow, wow, they are all interdependent on one another. And we are absolutely dependent on them uh, for an environment that's worth living in, and in addition to that, for our proteins. That, and, and our DNA, because that has plenty of nitrogen in it as well, and, and we could go on. All of life is dependent on this particular cycle. It's amazing. Just as the universe appears from its basic forces up to the structure of the Milky Way and beyond to be built for life to exist on Earth, life itself appears designed from the atoms up to be interdependent. It's just an absolute characteristic of living things. And the interesting thing is, if you look in the Bible, you, you actually see people talking about this and marveling about it. I love this uh, statement that uh, Solomon makes in, in Proverbs. He says, there are three things too amazing for me. Four, that I do not understand. The wisest man who ever lived. Yeah. The way of the eagle in the sky. The way of a snake on a rock. The way of a ship on the high seas. And the way of a man with a maid. The thing I like about this statement is everything is about a relationship there. The relationship between the bird and how well those wings fit their function in that medium to move the eagle through the air. And the way snakes move across the surface of the rocks. Yeah, those of you who are watching LLBN on Thursday night may have seen me bravely handling snakes. Well, one, not very dangerous snake. Um, but uh, yeah, it's incredible to feel how they move across your, the, you know, your skin and everything. Wow, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a marvel. There are, this is all about relationships. Everything is about relationships and interdependence, including, I believe, obviously, our relationship, our dependence on God as our sustainer, as our creator, our sustainer, and our savior. There's obviously a counter-argument to this. Um, it's interesting because it's theological, and yet you see people who claim to not be particularly theologically oriented making it um, all the time. God wouldn't have done it that way. By the way, you go back and you look at the ancient uh, Epicurean philosophers, and they were making this argument as well. Um, in any case, here's, here's John Avis. Um, uh, he says, uh, uh, yeah, Lesh Nihan syndrome hardly seems like the kind of outcome that would be countenanced by a loving, all-powerful deity. He's blaming God because nature just isn't good enough. Yeah. Um, if we go back just a few years, there's a very interesting um, uh, uh, poem that was written by Alfred Lord Tennyson uh, in memoriam. Uh, this particular poem was written um, in response to the death of a friend. It took him a long time, I think about 17 years, to write this, this unbelievable piece of, uh, of literature. Uh, it's probably worth noting that, uh, to a large extent, it was also a response to a book that was written in 18, or published in 1844. Okay, and he is talking about that book right here. It's uh, Robert Chambers' um, book, Vestiges of the Natural History of Creation, 1844. Amazing. This is, this is what Tennyson struggles with. This is what he's asking. He says, Are God and nature then at strife that nature lends such evil dreams, so careful of the type she seems, so careless of the single life? So careful of the type? He's talking here about different types of animals, different types of organisms. But no. From scarped cliff and quarried stone, she cries, a thousand types are gone. They're looking at the fossils and they're saying, wow, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's gone extinct. It's not here anymore. Yeah. Who, tr oh, yeah, she cries, a thousand types are gone. I care for nothing. All shall go. Who trusted God was love indeed? And love creation's final law. Though nature red in, cluth, in tooth and claw with raven shreked against his creed. These things that we struggle with today are not new. But they are also not ignored by at least the biblical account of a creator. Yeah. 
If God created all we see, how can he be a good creator when evil abounds in nature? I don't know about you, but I've struggled with that. Um, I don't think you can be a thinking person and not have struggled with that. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of really bad stuff out there. And we have a lot of really bad experiences. However, an imperfect design does not logically mean something wasn't designed. You're all old enough to remember this. Yeah, Ford Pinto. I actually remember my freshman year. There were these two beautiful twins. They had a baby blue Ford Pinto. I remember six of us going to, of all places, Chuck E. Cheese and then trying to pile back into that. Uh, for some reason, or other, six of us had to pile into the Ford Pinto, and it was a long drive back. Anyway, yeah, I, I can tell you lots about the bad design, but of course, uh, the, the exploding gas tanks was a spectacular thing. Dreadful design. But does that mean that it wasn't designed? Uh, it doesn't to me. It means it was designed, but it was bad. And what about other things? You know, what about atom bombs? You know, you should have taken atom bombs and blown up those Ford Pintos. Yeah, atomic bombs, they're bad things. Does anybody think that uh, atomic bombs are not designed? Yeah. Are the, are the Iranians going to get their atomic bomb, which they're definitely working on furiously? They're going to get their atomic bomb from um, just waiting for the sand to blow around and somehow or other sort the um, things into the right thing? No, 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 no. Those things are designed, no doubt about that. Bad design, evil design does not mean not designed. It's illogical to do that. These things, when we see them in nature, if we want to attribute nature to the good and the God of love that is described in the Bible, raise a question about God's goodness or God's competence. It turns out that belief in the goodness of the creator requires belief also in a fall. You can't have a good creator without a fall. Because you've got to have something to account for the evil that really is out there. Um, uh, Christians have tried uh, to explain things away in terms of, um, in various ways. Um, I, don't, I don't find any of those alternative explanations particularly satisfying. Yes, there's a fall, and that fall accounts for, in a logical way, the evil that we see while allowing us to still believe in a good God. Uh, the creation we now see is not as it came from the hand of the creator, but is instead a cursed vestige of what once was. That's what we chose. The whole point of the plan of salvation is to redeem the world from its fallen state and restore it as a new creation. That's what the Bible's all about. And uh, you can see this laid out in many places, I'm sure, but Romans 8, 20 and 21 certainly spells this out very nicely and succinctly. Not just humans, by the way, the whole of creation, which is interesting. So what is the absolute best evidence for a creator? I save the best till last. The creator God became part of nature, part of his own creation. He lived among men and demonstrated his power over nature by raising the dead, ultimately dying himself, then rising again. You can't beat that in terms of evidence. The creator God demonstrates his recreative power daily in the lives of millions of his born-again followers who are continually transformed into something new and beautiful. Doesn't mean we're perfect, but it does mean that he makes a very, very big difference. Our creator can be and wishes to be part of our daily experience. All right, thanks so much for listening. Let's talk. Um, Uh, yes.
Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very clear and powerful. Uh, Thank you. This you know, I don't think that it's because I'm that clear and powerful. I really, I really honestly believe that um, this is, you know, the Bible itself is very clear, and nature itself is not unambiguous. Well, well God blessed you with the ability to, <laughs> to present this in this manner. Now, this morning I was listening to, what's his name, David Asherick? Uh-huh. And he was contrasting something related to what you presented, mm -hmm. nature. Uh -huh. You mentioned, uh, what is it, Cicero, Cicero? Or? Cicero, yes. Okay. E emphasizing nature. We yeah. don't need it. Creating create. itself. Yeah. Doesn't, uh, uh, it wasn't Cicero. Um, it, you know, he, what he was trying to do was um, illustrate in this book the various different ideas out there. So I'm not sure that you could argue that Cicero himself was an Epicurean, but he's certainly trying to give a fair representation of the different views that were current at that time. So that tells me that uh, the great controversy is over worship. Do we give credit to God as creator, or do we credit nature? And that's, that's where the theory of evolution seems to come. In other words, there are many Adventists who do believe in the theory of evolution. And uh, that's a tragedy. You mentioned your daughter. Now, yeah, well, the, I, I'm, I'm glad to tell you that she, she made it through that experience. Good. It was just sort of a surprising <laughs> thing to me that, uh, that you would have a um, student newly out of an Adventist uh, university hired to s teach in an Adventist school, and he'd be wasting time in, in his class uh, talking about that, which had nothing to do with the, with the subject matter. Right. The now, the interesting thing is that the last call, there are two chapters in the Bible, Revelation 13 and 14. Hmm. Yeah. It's talking about worship. The yeah. Worship uh, him who made heaven and earth, the yeah. sea and the fountains of and waters. And a call to stop worshiping nature. A, stop to wor a call to stop worshiping the beast and the mark of the beast. Hmm and to call a call to worship the one who created. Yes. So if this is the last message to the world, it's not, what the, you know, it's not the last message. If you look at it, it's the everlasting gospel. Yeah. So, I right. mean, I'm assuming that means it's going to last forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So my, my question is, what are we doing trying to justify evolution in some of our schools. Well, let, 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 me, let me just comment on that briefly because obviously uh, we could spend a long time talking about that. Um, I personally was nearly fired for teaching evolution from, at an Adventist school when I was teaching it at Union College. And it is easy for um, uh, things to get out of control very, very fast in these circumstances especially when people are kind of hyped up about these things uh, at the moment. When we have concerns, um, I don't think we should do nothing, but we do need to go in and make sure that those concerns are genuinely uh, valid. I'll tell you what happened in my particular circumstance. Okay? Um, I was teaching uh, general biology for the very first time in an Adventist school. Okay? And um, uh, so we, uh, we got to the, um, uh, this, uh, uh, we're, we're going through, we used Campbell, which is one of the standard textbooks, and it's, it's a very good textbook in many ways. Um, uh, and uh, we got to the, to the section on evolution um, just as the Christmas break was coming up. And, um, uh, you know, I was inexperienced at these things. I thought that I had made it quite plain to the students that, that um, we were going to examine this and, uh, and so on. I think that they understood, but what happened was this. One of those students went home uh, for Christmas break, and um, they were sitting around the table, the big family Christmas dinner, and Grandma asked, what are you learning at Union College right now? And she said, oh, we just started learning about evolution. Okay. 
Apparently, there was no more conversation about this at the dinner table. Grandma didn't, didn't, um, it didn't, you know, it's a strange thing. In grandma's brain, she um, uh, thought, that seems wrong. Okay. But she didn't bother to dig a little bit deeper with this student. You know, are you being taught that evolution is true? Um, uh, what's going on there? Um, she just was shocked into silence, only briefly as it turned out, because the next thing that happened was she was on the phone with the pastor of her church uh, expressing outrage. The pastor was on the phone with his um, uh, 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 conference president expressing outrage. The conference president was on the phone with the union president because he was chair of, of the board. And the union, pre you know, and it's just escalating as things go, go on. And so all of a sudden there was a bombshell dropped on the uh, president of, of Union College, um, who then dropped it on my department chair, who then called me in. And by that particular point, of course, you know, we were doing, I don't know, naked satanic child sacrifices. Um, uh, so, um, you know, we do need to be careful. We do need to get our facts straight and so on. Um, I would say this about uh, this question of teaching evolution in Adventist schools. The, the, you've got to make sure that we're asking the right question about it if we're going to get the right answer. The right question is not whether we should teach about evolution in our schools. It is what should we teach about evolution. And certainly, we should be teaching what evolution is, what its strengths are, what its weaknesses are, why we don't believe that, and why we embrace a far more um, uh, wonderful alternative view that, in my opinion, has greater explanatory power, gives us hope for the future, and, and, and just makes sense. Thank you for explaining that. I was talking to one of the teachers at La Sierra, uh -huh. and I asked, are you teaching evolution as factual, as fact, or as a theory? He says, as a fact. There's no other logical, credible explanation for origins. Yeah. So I said, how are, are you presenting the problems Evolu the theory of evolution has? He says, no. I was hired to teach science, not religion. You know, it's kind of ironic. You know, you know I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to get into a great big uh, you know, uh, thing about the specific set of circumstances at, uh, at La Sierra University, in part because the truth is I haven't been there and um, you know, investigated it diligently myself. Um, obviously, there are a lot of people who are very concerned about what is going on there. Um, and uh, we need, you know, if, if we want to consider doing something practical about it, there are a number of things that I would say would apply to any Adventist school. Uh, the first thing, we need to be praying for these people. You know, um, if that is going on at an Adventist school, um, that represents not just a failure of that individual. It is a failure of leadership all the way up the chain. And leaders do need to be held accountable for failures on that kind of spectacular level. Um, but the truth is, you know, charging in there sort of on a white horse wearing our, sort of the armor of righteousness isn't necessarily going to address the problem. We really need a revival of faith um, and uh, a, a miracle. And, and we need to be praying for that praying that the Holy Spirit will work in these people's lives, praying that they will get that wisdom that only God can give. And, um, 
but also, um, in my opinion, holding those leaders who have been given by church members the power and authority to deal with these situations accountable when that is not being done. Yeah, but, but we must always behave like Christians, no matter what. That doesn't mean that people can take my money and do whatever they want with it or take God's money and do whatever they want with it. But it does mean that um, we need to be gracious and kind, but sometimes firm. Yes. You know, I've got two kind of totally unrelated questions. But first of all, this wonderful building that you've got over here, mm -hmm. yes. it would be nice if there were some kind of a museum or a visitor center or something that would kind of welcome you in there and give a little idea of what you're all about. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity that seems to be going missing. You're right. You know, um, yeah, there are any number of things that we would love to do with that building. Um, the things that constrain us uh, to one, money. <laughs> money, 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 money. And um, the other is simply time. You know, one of the things that I think uh, many um, Adventists don't understand is that uh, those of us who work over there work for the General Conference. We serve a global church, and there are five of us. And it's a great big world. And um, that means that we're, we're spread pretty thin. Um, uh, yeah, we have all kinds of ideas for more exhibits. We, we've got a few exhibits up there that, that people are welcome to come and see. And, um, and the interesting thing is, we, we regularly get um, requests from um, schools to bring students there and stuff. And we're always happy to do that and take them on a tour thing. But it's a working building. Yeah, that's yeah. true because I've been in it about three or four times, but there's nothing that just welcomes you in. And, you know, I've yeah. been to the Creation Museum in San Diego, which is really nice. Um, yes. You know, you wouldn't have to do something that extensive, but it would be nice to have something that invites you in and gives you a little bit of a idea of what it's all about and have some books out there on display and stuff. Sure. My other question... Are you volunteering to help us with it? <laughs> I wish I were yeah. knowledgeable enough to do that. I'd love to. The other unrelated question is on this little uh, cellular motor here. What drives... Oh, it's a generator, not a motor. Exactly, yeah, but, but it has to have the motor to drive the generator. So what drives the motor... The, the, the turbine part there at the top, the, 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 basically it's, it's, it's a torque generator. Right. And it is a um, <laughs> difference in the concentration of protons on either side of a, of a membrane, okay. uh, the, the inner membrane of the mitochondria in the case of your particular uh, cells. Okay. And, and the energy comes from ultimately your food, I guess. And then what yeah. does the generator generate when it generates? It, it generates adenosine triphosphate, ATP. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's converting um, adenosine diphosphate, ADP, into ATP. And that ATP um, uh, is, is used as sort of a fundamental energy currency inside cells. Cells do a lot of phosphorylation and dephosphorylation to drive reactions in various directions. It's like the cell. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Scripture speaks well of the curse of the earth. Yes. How do you account for colliding galaxies and things that we see in the universe? Cool. <laughs> yeah, why, why, why would I? You know, first of all, let me say a couple of things. First, I'm a biologist. Um, I don't account for things like that. <laughs> I'm, I, I stick humbly with, uh, within my own discipline. But uh, yeah. I'm all for it. I like explosions. <laughs> I guess I'm asking how far out did sin reach? I don't know. Yeah. I, know I know that, um, I, I, I do know that you can trace that question back to Plato, not, not to um, Christianity, um, and pro probably beyond that. You know, um, Plato and the Greeks had this, this geocentric cosmology going, and, um, and uh, uh, they believed that as you went out from the, uh, from the earth, which was kind of like a sewer for the universe, um, you, 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 you had a different kind of situation going on in the, 
up there in the heavens. The heavens were the um, uh, habitat of the gods. Everything was perfect. They watched how things moved in regular sorts of ways. Uh, they did have some problems with the planets because they exhibit that retrograde motion and things like that. But uh, Ptolemy kind of figured out a way of keeping everything perfect circles. Uh, this, is, this is one reason why um, you know, Galileo got it wrong with his, his heliocentric cosmology because even though he had the, the data available really that, uh, that um, uh, Kepler had, um, he just uh, refused to believe that the heavens exhibited anything other than perfect circles because philosophically um, he was influenced by that idea that circles are perfect and so those are the kinds of motions that we should be seeing exhibited in space. Um, so um, I personally don't have a problem with sin extending all the way to heaven seeing as that's where Satan was and there was war there. So, And I personally do not see the collision of universes or I should say galaxies as being um, uh, anything other than fun. But, you know, do I, have a, do I have a theological basis for that or anything? No, but I sure enjoy watching stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yes. Question on that uh, ATP uh, synthesis uh, pump. Yes. Is that being driven by the influx of sodium uh, ions or the potassium ion influx? Which you do, have they figured that out yet? Um, no, it's not, it's not a sodium-potassium thing. It, 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 it is, it's, a, it's a proton thing. Um, uh, during, uh, uh, yeah, here we go. See, down below, I'm going to get myself into deep water. You're going to have to save me here. It's been a, it's been a few years since, since I taught um, uh, uh, any, any of this stuff. But basically, you have this glycolytic pathway when you take sugar in and, and you're metabolizing it. Glycolytic pathway... Um, uh, takes a few hydrogens um, and uh, and those get get fed into another thing but then then you feed into the Krebs cycle and in the Krebs cycle you're taking more of these hydrogens off okay and they get fed into the electron transport chain it's the electron transport chain that winds up producing a proton gradient across the surface of this um, this inner membrane of the mitochondria and it's that proton gradient that is being taken advantage of. Now, um, you know, one of the basic things about chemistry is if you, if you have a different concentration on one side than is on another, then the, um, to, to reach the lower energy state, you have diffusion going on. So there is potential energy by having that barrier separating the two, and that potential energy is being harnessed by that yep. device. The reason why I was wondering is because in cardiology, we're dealing with all of these different uh, medications, for actually, that have influence on both the sodium pump, sodium transport, potassium pump, uh -huh. potassium transport, and the calcium pump. And uh, we see phenomenal things. I know you guys killed my things. mother with some of that we, stuff. We see, <laughs> see phenomenal things going on with yeah. these uh, medications and uh, different chemicals uh, that we use all the time in cardiology to allow um, modification of these pumps to do certain things for the cells. In fact, uh, somebody said that if digoxin was uh, introduced today, it'd be considered to be a, a digoxin accelerator of uh, the sodium transport, kind of interesting that you'd have you know some of these things that are that are negative influence on the pumps, and there are certain things that are positive influence on the pumps. Yeah, you can you can modulate them um, in in various ways, but yeah, as a, as a cardiologist, you're also painfully aware of of how interdependent these things are. That's why they work. Um, obviously, you're really not trying to treat somebody's sodium potassium or, or calcium pump situation, you're trying to adjust a, yeah, exactly, a specific situation, and you also know how wildly things can go wrong. That's why you can't buy these things over the counter. They're not for self-administration. It takes very careful uh, modulation of, of these things to not kill people and to actually get the effect that you want. Um, it would be nice if you could just easily do things, but life is this very integrated, interdependent system. Yeah.
I should now point out that it's uh, a little tiny bit past 11.30. I know there are some of you who have to be elsewhere. Um, <clears throat> we will stay and entertain questions from the floor as long as uh, uh, Tim's patience and time uh, hold out. Well, I'm happy to. Thank you so much for having me. This has been <laughs> fun. <Yeah. clears throat> um, Ariel? Uh, just a, a, a thought. Uh, many things. Many things I'd like to comment on. This is a very good presentation. Uh, uh, just to get to an issue that uh, I'm concerned about, and I don't have an answer for. Uh -huh. They're the best kind. Uh, we're dealing with these uh, people trained in empiricism, and they, they want solid data. They accept only that which they can see more or less with their senses and, and so on. Uh, and the great question they often raise, you know, one, one they raise is, well, where is your God? Another one is, why is there so much suffering? Yeah. And uh, what would be a, an intelligent way of trying to approach this question of suffering that we're all aware of, Darwin, of course, you know, and this is, uh, you know, uh, this is one of his cardinal reasons for rejecting uh, Christianity. Uh, what, how, how could we approach this empirical mind that, that's, uh, you know, you talk about Satan, I, they might accept, well, maybe a designer, possibly, then you start talking about Satan and evil, which I think you need to bring into the issue if you're going to explain suffering. Uh, you have any suggestions how to go there well, about this? You know, there there are a few things that, in my opinion, we need to keep in mind. One, there is no perfect argument or perfect situation that that you can come up with that um, is going to work for, for everybody. Um, the, the bottom line is God created a very good world um, in his own words. God communed face to face with Adam and Eve and they, at least I believe, were a lot smarter and better than me. They chose to believe something different, despite all evidence as far as, uh, well, at least despite mm -hmm. abundant evidence of the goodness of God and the uh, truthfulness and, and all the rest of it. They chose to believe a lie and... Um, so, you know, when somebody chooses to believe a lie, it's very, I don't know, you know, it's a miracle of the Holy Spirit to save them from that. Um, think about people who believe in conspiracy theories. Yeah, there is, other, there are otherwise intelligent people. I got, I, I got cornered not all that long ago by the president of a large Adventist hospital who had embraced a crazy belief, in my opinion, about the kind of water you drink. And there was nothing that I could say that would, seeing as I was eating lunch at his house, um, I didn't want to be too rude and blunt, but there was nothing I could say to um, derail this bizarre idea that he had become a proponent of. Um, uh, so... You know, the number one thing, if we want to change 
people's minds is to understand that that is a miracle and the Holy Spirit is involved in that. That, that would be my number one thing. As far as um, uh, arguments that at least make sense to me, the first thing that I think that, that we need to do is to make these guys fight on their own ground, not on ours. And by that I mean this. If you're a materialist, what's so wrong with suffering? What's wrong with that? In fact, um, people have uh, argued very passionately that suffering is a good thing and struggle and uh, Mein Kampf, for crying out loud. Mein Kampf, it, one of the central themes of Mein Kampf is that the struggle, it means my struggle, um, Hitler's uh, philosophy, the Nazi um, ideology embraced the idea that through struggle you get advancement and through the struggle of the German people. He didn't, you know, um, they don't appear to have genuinely believed that they were the super race that they were aspiring to be. Um, part of the strategy for achieving that, um, that better set of circumstances was to go through this struggle that we call the Second World War. This is why at the end of the war, Hitler gave up um, because he realized that the Slavic people, particularly the Russians, were going to best them in the struggle for survival. And within that view, there was no point in going on. Um, so, so in any, in any case, um, yeah, why, you know, that, that would be, that, I, I think, you know, using the Socratic method sometimes is useful and not letting them off. Why, what's so wrong with, with suffering? You know, Christians, we understand that the world is not the way it should be. Surely a materialist would have to say the world is exactly the way it should be. Why would you complain about suffering? Yeah. Um, and, and you know, there's, mm -hmm. then, then you can <clears throat> also say, well, you know, if you want evidence, what's so wrong with the Bible? Why mm -hmm. would you deny that historical record? It's right there. I mean, <clears throat> don't, don't, you know, any, any, any other, I mean, you know, I believe that mm -hmm. Julius Caesar attacked Britain and conquered it. Why? Because Julius Caesar wrote a heroic account of his own brilliance and tells us so. So why would I believe that historic history and not this other history that is supported by multiple eyewitness accounts and not, interestingly enough, not contradicted by other eyewitness accounts? Um, you know, what, what else does God have to do other than come down, live among men, do miracles, and the whole rest of it? Uh, and, and, you know, then you do have the argument from design. I mean, <coughs> it, it isn't as if there isn't an abundance of arguments. There is, what there, uh, there is a lack of is an abundance of willing hearts. I like your last approach there. Uh, and I... Uh, I think along the line, and uh, have had some success with some, some people along this line, that if there is a God, and, you know, most of them, they have a hard time. When you talk, talk talking about the original life and this stuff, they have a hard time uh, saying you're, you're wrong, it happened all by itself. They have a very hard time with that. Once, once you admit there is a God, uh, it's a terrible slippery slope. Uh, <laughs> there, there ought to be some communication from him, uh, simply because you know well, we're 
thinking beings. We, we have vocabulary, we have language, and all the stuff to, to, to think about. Uh, that maybe uh, the Bible is his communication, and to, to me that uh, opens up the door to uh, yeah. evil, the origin of evil, and the great controversy, which I feel you know uh, is so important to this argumentation. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the beautiful thing about biblical Christianity, and I want to be careful about that because, you know, for, for reasons that I try to understand, there are a lot of people who want to somehow or other hang on to some bits and pieces of Christianity while at the same time cutting out other bits and pieces of Christianity that are sort of so it's, it's also an interdependent, integrated system of, of beliefs. Um, uh, but revealing how much sense biblical Christianity actually does make is possibly a useful thing. That's, that's what I would put in the category of being, being ready to um, you know, defend your faith. Um, but not necessarily being willing to engage in endless debates. Um, I don't think they're going to ultimately help us. Yes, Natalie. Um, I've, I've grown up essentially uh, away from Adventist or Christian educational institutions from communist Yugoslavia through essentially entirely secular educational systems all the way to advanced degrees. And I've, I've had to deal with these issues. You know, you go through personal experiences in crises, and you, ha you're, you cannot avoid but be confronted by these issues. And why suffering is the major, the greatest issue that any one of us can ever confront. Naturally being surrounded by the overwhelming, uh, pervasive uh, culture of evolutionary doctrine, uh, which purported to answer those questions, I never felt it was satisfying, and it was for this reason. As I'm uh, looking at suffering, Naturally, I wish to see a solution for it. Evolutionary doctrine does not solve suffering. It merely legitimizes it. Hmm. So why would I, shocked by suffering, embrace a line of thinking that, that now it. Yes. enshrines it. Yes. This is a logical conflict. It, 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 so I'm, I'm perplexed by our, how should I say, advanced degree people who argue this point and not see the obvious inconsistency in it. I mean, if I feel that somebody's my enemy, I want to be as far from them as I could physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally be parted. I don't want to be close to them now. Oh, so this is now the greater reality. How have I solved anything? Yeah. You know, I personally think that it takes a... a, a um special kind of genius to embrace uh, logically incoherent views at the same time. And uh, really, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that um, you know, facetiously. Um, for some reason or other, um, yeah, I, well, I, let's put it this way. One of, one of the things that attracted me to science in the first place was Occam's razor. Uh, which is basically the idea 
that where you find um, a, a, some phenomenon that is um, I explainable via you know, multiple um, you know, explanations, you, you generally go with the simplest explanation um, because that's the most likely to be the true one. Um, and uh, this has worked very nicely, certainly in physics, um, where you have these beautifully elegant uh, formulas that describe unbelievable amounts of stuff. Um, so it's, it's very impressive. Um, and, and yet, for some reason or other, in this area of origins, people seem to want to embrace views that are not um, not simple. Um, uh, pro probably the most complex, in my, from my perspective, is th this idea of, of theistic evolution. Um, you have the, it, it turns the problem of evil into how we came to be and God's method of doing things. All that, all that death and suffering in the, um, uh, in my opinion, it turns God into a monster. Um, but and, also, and, also, and it's very hard to sort of pin it down because it's, you know, yeah. I see it as being kind of like Maria, you know, in the Sound of Music. How do, how, how do you catch a cloud and pin it down? Um, uh, you, you uh, because it seems like each advocate of this view. Um, e even when I've tried to, you know, just I, I want to understand. I, I don't. I don't want. I'm not trying to, um, uh, you know, make other people look like idiots and me look like a genius or something. I really genuinely want to know. Maybe I'm just too stupid to understand. But um, I, I personally have not come across um, a an explanation of theistic evolution that, is, that does anything other than rely on fuzziness instead of um, uh, so Now, uh, you, you know, on the one hand, it kind of resolves a whole bunch of problems by making them vague. Um, it's, uh, but I personally don't find that to be a satisfying solution to problems. I, I, surely, as Christians, you know, we, we live by faith, and so therefore we can look and say, "Yeah, you know what? For me, in my mind, there is a tension between those colliding galaxies up there, and my understanding of, uh, you know, my uh, from, from my understanding of the Bible." Uh, of how the universe should be, or something like that. I'm, I'm not saying that's 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 your thinking. I'm just saying, you know, you you, you could go with something like that, or um, or, or any. Th th there's a tension there. I, I will tell you, for me, there are certain things out there, um, certain aspects of radiometric dating, that, yeah, you know what, um, or or possibly. Um, uh, yeah, you know, other things in the geologic record. I'm not a geologist. I don't fully understand every nuance of everything. But there are certain things there that seem to me to sort of stand in tension with the idea that God created in the relatively recent past the world that we see today and the life on it. Um, no doubt about that. But what else would I expect? You know, as a Christian, that I, I expect. I don't expect to have all the answers. Um, I expect that that um, you know now we see through a glass darkly, and I don't fully understand everything. Um, uh, there are these beautiful examples in the Bible of people who are struggling with stuff, and it turned out that the that the answer was embarrassingly uh, simple. Uh, my, one of my favorite stories is is the, the you know the Sadducee comes to Jesus with the story of the woman who married the seven brothers. Yes, and um, you know, I'm sure that they didn't make up that story just for Jesus. This, was, this, this sounds like a standard sort of village atheist kind of thing. And 
So they don't believe in the resurrection or anything like that. And um, so they're going to um, present, present Jesus with the, with the story that they've successfully stumped those Pharisees with over and over again. I personally think the Pharisees were right on that particular issue. Um, and, uh, and the Pharisees obviously didn't have a very good answer for them. But not having a good answer doesn't necessarily mean you're wrong. And then Jesus comes back with, there's no marriage in heaven. You, know, you can just... <laughs> you can't, can't you just see all the wheels spinning? <laughs> Uh, so the guy, the, you know, the guy must have felt like such a, uh, such a fool. At least I would have. Um, because I've done that sort of thing before, and I certainly felt like a fool. Um, uh, but, you know, so, you know, things, things that I cannot, you know, or don't have a beautiful explanation for, I don't fully understand right now. You know what? Those are interesting things. That's what makes us want to study them and see, see, see what might be out there. Um, sometimes the solutions might be amazingly, amazingly simple. And I, I think about things like um, these turbidites. You know, I, by the way, I'm not trying to claim that turbidites explain everything in the geologic column or whatever, but certainly they're an eye-opener that you can make an awful lot of layers of rock in a very short period of time. Who'd have thought? Not me. Um, and, it, and it took really observation to understand how those things really work. So we have tension. There might be solutions. We might come up with reasonable answers. Or we might not. But we live by faith. The faith is not based on nothing. The faith is consistent with, I would submit to you, the existence of nature in the first place, <laughs> the existence of life, the diversity of life, the wonderful uh, beauty and, and, and so on that we see, the, the, the pain and suffering that we see out there. I mean, all of this comes together in such a beautifully coherent way within this view that I'm willing to tolerate a bit of tension out there and certainly to expect a bit of tension out there. Um, <clears throat> one uh, uh, observation uh, that I think is, uh, I, I'll make explicit, and that is that if you try to join uh, polymers and you take out water, that generally is an energy consuming process which means yeah. that the well, and certainly in an aqueous environment, the, the reverse which is process is in fact an energy releasing process. Which means that in, when things go to equilibrium, they break apart. That's right. Yeah. And and that's the problem. If you want to put it this way, it's like slot machines that go bad after a while. If you're going to put it into the okay. slot machine mode, that periodically. Uh, that, that the slot machine analogy is an overestimate rather than an underestimate of the of the probability of being able to get a and this is particularly true when you 're talking about life once you have life, living organisms can organize their environment to a certain extent can organize their internal environment to a certain extent um, can use energy to rebuild yeah, but, stuff. Yeah, there is there is one thing that I, just just. just like but if you try to yeah. do it on life itself, before yeah. there is any of this kind of building up stuff, uh, your slot machines fall apart. Well, there, there just isn't a slot machine. It's just <laughs> yeah, in fact, there isn't a slot machine, and there are no quarters either. Um, <laughs> the 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 um, uh, you know one point that that if you want to take from this presentation, I, I would like to make it a central point of another presentation that I, that I want to do. But, you know, these gigantic global cycles on which life depends, like the nitrogen cycle, you can't, you can't just have the first life evolve and, um, 
and suddenly be excited about that because life doesn't work that way. Um, you have to have that whole thing in place um, on some sort of reasonable temporal scale before you can have any other life. Um, uh, you know, um, imagine if you only had nitrogen fixation. Yes, you, know, you, can, get, you can get your proteins and, and your nucleic acids and, and you're off and running. Well, maybe, but what that means is without denitrification and, and so on, um, it means that you are going to have a buildup of mm -hmm. compounds that contain nitrogen that is not in its triple bonded low energy state. Mm -hmm. You're turning the entire surface of the earth into a stick of dynamite mm -hmm. when you do that. Okay. You can't do it. And even though nitrate itself, mm -hmm. you know, it, let's, say, let's say you have um, uh, you know, the process that turns the ammonia into nitrate. Nitrate itself, it, that's, that's not a free lunch either. Um, you've got to have some way of getting it back into the, into the atmosphere um, mm -hmm. for, for, for so, many, so many reasons. Nitrate is water-soluble. That's why nitrate, using nitrate as a fertilizer is problematic if you over-fertilize. It all winds up in the water, and then you get algal blooms, blooms and all the rest of it. So mm -hmm. if, if, if you didn't have it returning to the atmosphere, you would wind up with the oceans flooded with all of that nitrogen in the form of nitrate and no ability to, to get nitrogen onto land. It doesn't evaporate with the rain and come down or something. Um, I mean, there, there are just, I mean, and, and you can just go on and on and on. It becomes pedantic very fast. You have to have that complete cycle. It is one of the most amazing feats of engineering that anybody could study. Um, I don't know who's next, but okay. whoever starts talking first. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, regarding the woman who had seven husbands, Yes. That is in the Catholic Bible. I would expect it, it would be it, in their I Bible. Read it. Yeah. I read it. Yeah. It, it is in the Catholic Bible. Yeah. Now, my question has to do with the design. Mm -hmm. Are you uh, saying it's not in the Protestant Bible or something? Or do we really it's have It's not Bible? in our Bible, but it is in the Catholic Bible. Oh, no, no, no. You're, talk you're talking about the, the, the story the, in the Apocrypha. Right, yes. Apocrypha. Yeah. Um, yeah, but no, I'm, ta I'm talking about when Jesus... Uh, Jesus was confronted. Now, this is, this is in the in the Gospels. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the, but the, I mean the, the original the, story. Oh, the original story. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, regarding design, I recently <laughs> read the Apocrypha. It was an interesting interesting okay. exercise. Yeah. Okay. Many years ago, Collins. Yeah, I don't remember his first name, but Francis he, Collins. Francis yeah, Collins. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He was here on campus oh. for a graduation ceremony. Yeah. He was the main speaker. And uh, he said, I was tempted to read to you the genome, the entire genome. <laughs> and then I figured out it would take me 32 years of nonstop reading to complete the project. Oh. Well, I was so impressed that I spent the money and purchased his book. Uh -huh. yes. And then I was disappointed. Yes. He's a because he, yeah. in spite of that, he believes in evolution. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is the DNA an evidence for design or for a common ancestor? Yes. <laughs> um, look, all evidence is interpreted through worldviews and accommodated into those worldviews in, in, in various ways. And the kind of evidence that you get out of DNA is not different from the kind of evidence, really, that you get from looking at things and stuff. Um, it still is interpreted in various ways. Um, you know, I look at um, 
the similarity between your genes, let's say, and those in a banana, and it suggests to me that um, there is, uh, you know, something, there's some sort of commonality between you and bananas. Uh, what is it, 70% or something? Yeah. And of course, the, with these types of things, lying with statistics is the easiest thing to do because by the same, what do we really mean? But um, the bottom line is, yeah, you and I, we have a lot in common with bananas. Um, uh, so so how, what, what do we make of that? Do we say, um, uh, well, therefore, we share a common ancestor with a banana, um, with bananas, or do we say that there is, um, uh, you know, what it suggests is there is some single origin, some single origin for these things when we see those commonalities. Um, uh, if, if I look at a, um, uh, my, my car, it's a Mazda 626. If anybody has any recommendations on a better, newer car, please let me know. Um, it's a Mazda 626, and I look at um, uh, uh, the components that it's made from. Uh, it turns out that uh, those components are very similar to other Mazdas. In fact, um, they're very similar to um, uh, Toyotas and Fords and, and the components in my blender. Um, uh, you know, and, and my heating and cooling system. I mean, there, there are screws and bolts and, and there are electric motors and all sorts of things in common. They're, they're made out of similar materials. There are certain metals and plastics that are used across all of these things. Um, uh, you know, do, do, I, do I come up with common ancestry to explain um, uh, those things? No. Really what we're looking at there is the expansion of common ideas, or common inventions, and so on. Not, it's not necessarily evidence of common ancestry. It's not logically, at least in my opinion, evidence of common ancestry. Um, uh, we can call it evidence of common design uh, when you see those similarities. There, there's, there's a single source to, in, in the case of, of, the, of the DNA. Probably more interesting to me uh, things that show up in the wrong place okay, according to one theory versus another. So in the case of bananas, for example, bananas uh, are related to bird of paradise um, uh, flowers that, that, that we have around here. If you, if you look at their flowers and their leaves, you can see the commonality between them and banana plants. Um, it turns out that the white, uh, it's a white bird of paradise um, flowers, they've looked at the seeds, the bright, bright orange seeds that those particular plants produce. And lo and behold, the bright orange pigment in those seeds is bilirubin. Um, yeah, you know, any of you who know anything about biochemistry, um, it should be having difficulty picking yourself up off the floor right now. It's Billy Rubin for crying out loud. I, um, how do you get Billy Rubin, which is the orange stuff that shows up in the, you know, in the skin of babies when, when they're jaundice and other people who have liver problems, um, how do you get that in bird of paradise plants? Um, as far as I know, it doesn't show up in other plants. You know, common ancestry doesn't account for that sort of thing very well. And in fact, with many, many things like that now, there is no attempt to accommodate it into common ancestry. Um, it's accounted for by horizontal uh, or lateral uh, gene transfer. Yeah. Um, uh, in which, who's to, in which case, who's to say that it wasn't um, designed uh, horizontal 
gene transfer. Well, exactly. That's, that's what I do in my lab. Um, you know, I take a human gene or something and I, I stuff it into a bacteria so that I can study it. Um, or, you know, a gene, most of the time I, I, I work with um, uh, nematodes. But for that? There's no way that they can rearrange the evolutionary trees to account for that. Maybe they'll say, you know, we just haven't found that common ancestor. Um, just being yeah, this, this, yeah, this, this, this is a major question, actually, that a lot of people are struggling with right now. Um, this, is, this is why you have people like Carl Woos, who are suggesting that there is no single common ancestor. There is no, there's no, there's no real trunk to the tree that it's this interconnected web uh, or, or, or um, you know, yeah, Lynn, Lynn Margulis, you know, she's really into the idea of uh, now of, of whole um, genome uh, blending, essentially, um, where you take two organisms. Um, this, this is a way of accounting for things like butterflies, for example, where, where you have uh, this creature that lives only to eat. Um, uh, it has no capacity for reproduction. And then it goes through metamorphosis as a completely different creature that lives pretty much only to reproduce. Um, and it's beautiful. How do, you, um, how do you accommodate those sorts of things within a sort of evolutionary paradigm? Well, she wants to bring um, uh, two totally different genomes together, somehow or other, this flying creature and this worm-like creature, their right. genomes get blended. <laughs> and um, uh, you know, th th there are problems with that because, again, if you, if you look at genomes, mm -hmm. for example, um, the last one that I looked at, this was a couple of years ago, the um, purple sea urchin, uh, which is an example of a creature that goes from a larval stage that's just utterly different, different symmetry, different everything, and turns into a sea urchin. Um, there, there, were, there were a number of quite surprising things about that, that genome. But um, uh, certainly to me, what I was interested in was the um, expression, gene expression patterns. And it turns out that there is no separate set of genes that's being expressed in the larval stage that's then being switched off in a totally different set of genes being expressed in the adult uh, stage. The, the, the bottom line is, the evidence really doesn't support that, and frankly, it just beggars the imagination so dramatically mm -hmm. that um, I don't know. You know, to me, to me, you're getting so far out there. Uh, well, look, you can you can explain anything, in my opinion, within any worldview. You can do that. It's not that there's no explanation. It's just how ridiculous does the explanation have to be? before you start saying, I don't think that this is really going to work. It's what you call a fact three science. Yes, but it's not, it's not science. I mean, you know, science yeah. is built on metaphysics and... Um, and you go the other route and say it's not even true. I mean, it's not even false. Yeah, I think that, yeah, it's, it's yeah, not, even, not even wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let's, let's make yours the last one, because I, I do need to um, uh, oh. get back. We have some visitors coming. Yeah, forward. this is uh, just this. And this whole cycle, I don't know why photosynthesis is ignored in this whole battle, because it's so terribly important. And it seems to me you've got, you got a really fertile area of... Well, the, um, thing, the thing that amazes me about photosynthesis, um, and, 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 and by the way, um, don't... Um, you know, photosynthesis is so much more spectacular than respiration, and respiration staggers me. Um, but the oldest evidence of life, okay, which if you go by conventional dating, is, is more than 3.8 billion years old. Where, uh, just to put things in perspective, the Earth didn't have a crust until four billion years ago. I'm just giving you the conventional thing, uh, conventional wisdom. You have something less than 200 million years to get the first life, probably, probably um, several tens of millions of years less than that. 
Um, the problem is that the evidence of that life is graphite with a certain ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-14. See, with photosynthesis, when photosynthesis occurs, there is, there is a certain bias um, in terms of the isotopes of carbon that are taken in. Carbon-13 is very stable. It's not like carbon-14. Sorry, carbon-12 and carbon-13 is the ratio that I'm talking about. It's, it's anything, any carbon that has been fixed by photosynthesis has this signature ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And um, if you're seeing that, you know, less than 200 million years after the formation of the crust of the Earth, what that means is photosynthesis, it's not just that you have to somehow or other evolve simple life, you have to evolve photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, I mean, I, I remember when I was in graduate school, I took a really, probably one of the most useful classes I've ever taken. It was, it was called Microbial Physiology and Metabolism. And the guy who taught the course, it was in a room about this size, but it was flat and it had windows all along one side. Every other wall was covered with blackboards like this. Also, there were, there were three walls covered with those. And the beginning of the lecture, he'd start writing on one side, and he would go all the way around the room, and sometimes he'd start again. And it was marvelous. And you learned about all of these amazing fermentations and, and, and all sorts of stuff. But photosynthesis, which bacteria do, I spent... I don't know how long, trying to work through it so that I really understood it. Um, bear in mind, you know, when, when you do biology, you study photosynthesis in high school and it's little balls and things like that. And then, then you do general biology and it's still little balls because they ignore photosynthesis because it's just so much more complicated. And then you... Then you um, you know, take biochemistry, and oh, oh, you know, you, you learn um, a little bit more, but you really, you know, even in, in undergraduate biochemistry, you don't really get a grip on the Calvin cycle. And I was determined to get a grip on the Calvin cycle. I don't have a grip on the Calvin cycle. I, I, I just don't. I, I, I doubt that anybody does. You know, just just figuring out, you know, getting getting it to balance. Whoa, you've got all these, you know, pentoses and heptoses and stuff going in all sorts of different directions, and somehow or other, out the end of it, you wind up um, uh, getting something. But wow, wow. Um, I don't know. Danilo, are you impressed by it? I am. <laughs> well, it, it, have no arguments of creation. Yeah. Um, you know, getting that in 200 million years or less is... All while you have a very hot crust. Presumably, yes. Um, a very different set of circumstances. Yeah, no, yeah, that, that's right. No biochemist sort of guiding things. <laughs> and, and, and um, yeah, no, no condensation reactions in your aqueous um, <laughs> environment, assuming that there, that there are warm little pools at all. And by the way, if the Earth was that hot, then wouldn't all the water have been evaporated up? Oh, you've got all sorts of problems with the atmosphere, at, for, for, uh, um, formation of the atmosphere um, because of heat, yes. Um, I don't fully understand that, but um, there, there are, you know, this, this, is, this is one reason why, for example, I don't think that there's anybody out there who believes that the atmosphere had any abundance of hydrogen ever in it uh, because the escape velocity is so slow. And that's a function of heat. Um, 
oh, yeah, the presence of oxygen and, and whether it was a reducing atmosphere and blah, blah, blah. But if you've got photosynthesis, I think you're going to start getting oxygen pretty fast. And by the way, photosynthesis is also dependent on water. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, Lenore? Isn't that why, now why they're beginning to suggest that there is, some, there is a purpose in the atoms? Yeah, you know, it's kind of like a new, um, new sort of uh, pantheism, isn't it? Yeah. Um, one of the things that is liberating about believing the biblical account of creation is that it prevents you from becoming an animist. And personally, I don't see the difference between some of these ideas that are being put out there about self-organization and blah, 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 and animism. What you're doing is you are ascribing spooky properties to matter that matter just doesn't have. Um, how is that different from animism? I don't, I don't really see it. I mean, you can couch it in all sorts of... Um, complicated lingo. words and lingo and stuff, but it's, I, I don't see functionally how it's different. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, have a happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath yeah. to you.